welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for a special episode of the podcast. Today we are joined by Dr. Kirk Honda, Professor in the School of Applied Psychology at Antioch University in Seattle, Washington. He's a Doctor of Psychology, a practicing marriage and family therapist, and he hosts a podcast and YouTube channel called Psychology in Seattle, and he's been doing that since 2008. Welcome, Dr. Honda. Thanks. Um, I love Game of Thrones. I love talking about it. So let's talk about it. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, so McKelly, why don't you why don't you prime us by mentioning why we got in touch with Dr. Honda? You you read something by him, right? I did. I was actually I was preparing for an episode. It was a uh, Sansa's first ep- uh, chapter in A Clash of Kings, and Joffrey was just being his. Uh, particularly mean and nasty self. And I thought, I wonder if there's anyone out there who has ever, you know, tried to provide insight into Joffrey and what makes him tick. And so I I went searching and I I came across a a write-up about Dr. Honda's uh, diagnosis of, uh, (laughs) of the King of Westeros. And I thought, you know, I wrote stuff up and I, that, that I was going to mention that Dr. Honda had, had said. And then I thought, you know what might be more interesting? Let's see if we could get Dr. Honda to come on our show and, and talk about it himself. So we reached Way out do it. and yeah, and here uh, we are. So we're going to focus on Joffrey because, you know, he's the most, well, he's certainly an interesting character. Um, so um, um, as, as we were talking about this before, we, uh, we don't want to, create any spoilers but obviously dr honda knows the whole story and so he can sort of like base his uh, opinions on joffrey on the whole story but we're hopefully going to try and avoid uh, any particular specific spoilers so just a sort of reminder to the listeners as well where we stand in the story we uh we know that joffrey's you know overindulged uh he did lie in order to get Arya into trouble and that led to Nymeria being sent away and the death of both Lady and Micah, the butcher's boy. He has been kind and gracious to Sansa, but he also has his Kingsguard beat her on regular occasions. He has issued, since becoming king, he's issued several outlandish rulings at the court, fights to the death and people being thrown into the dungeon just for petitioning for their family. Uh, He did force Sansa to uh, look at his father's her father's severed head and Septim Ordains as well. Um, and he was going to, the last thing he did before uh, um, the, where we are in the books now is he was going to have Sodontus Holler drowned in, in wine for turning up drunk to his uh, name day celebration. So, um, oh, and yes, th- that same episode, actually, that same chapter, he completely forgot about his own father's death when Tyrion offered him condolences, which struck both me and McKelly as kind of interesting that he basically, Tyrion offered him condolences and Joffrey looked at him puzzled like what oh yes that yeah, yeah right yeah we were we were surprised because he doesn't know he's a product of incest he thinks king robert was his father so right. he cared so little that he completely forgot that his own <laughs> father had recently been murdered or died anyway so okay so that's that's the baseline where we're, we're coming from so, so so now we're just going to fire some questions at you if that's okay sure um so okay let, let me fra- let me sort of couch this question in in the sort of real world, there's recent years, there's been a lot of people sort of um, talking about diagnosing politicians, I'll, I'll say, um, for their mental sort of health. But but a lot of them sort of qualify that any statement by saying, I wouldn't want to diagnose someone without talking to them. Um, I, I understand that, I think, but but with fictional characters obviously it's not feasible so if we were if you were able to make a diagnosis of Joffrey how much faith would you be able to put in it based on the fact that it's of limited evidence and no personal contact yeah it's a good question I don't think I've ever been asked that the reason why we refrain from diagnosing from afar as we say is because it is uh, wisely deemed unethical right because one you don't have access to the person clinically and you're only viewing them through a limited pinhole of data acquisition. The other is, is that uh, if you did have access to data, it's unethical to broadcast someone's right. clinical right. diagnosis to the, to the public. And, but when it comes, so when it comes to a fictional character, obviously we're not going to harm Joffrey by 
by diagnosing him. But there's another reason why we refrain from diagnosing from afar, because it gives the impression that somehow we can diagnose from afar. And, and, and usually when we're talking about something like Joffrey, we're talking about personality disorder. Now, if someone suffered from panic attack disorder or from major depressive disorder, that would be pretty easy to diagnose. But some, usually we're talking about a personality disorder. And in my clinical experience, it takes me at least five sessions, if not maybe 25 sessions to have a good idea as to what's going on personality wise in the individual. And so we don't wanna give it the impression to the public that somehow clinicians, good clinicians just throw around clinical terms. Um, having said that with Joffrey, we get a fair amount of data given to us by Martin. And, um, and so I think that I can say some things about his personality. The other thing is, is that Martin was clearly trying to write uh, a similar profile of previous uh, rulers who exhibited these behaviors. I, I don't know exactly who Joffrey is modeled after. Maybe y'all know, but uh, and these people actually existed, and and uh, there's you know a fair amount of speculation as to even those real individuals as to what was going on for them. Yeah, uh, that, I'm I'm glad I asked that question. That's fascinating to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. So we all we all know that uh, Robert and Cersei did not have the happiest of marriages. So I guess a good place to start might be how their relationship affected Joffrey and wh whether if they're, if they had had a happy marriage and everything else was the same, might he have come out differently? It's a, a nature versus nurture question. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It seems likely. And um, so there's a few things that I'll say. The, the first maybe quicker answer is that there's a lot of royalty even in you know British royalty, who are aren't raised by their parents, they're raised by governoresses or whatever you call oh, them yeah. over there, sure. <laughs> and um, governesses and or nannies or whatever we call them, and a lot of times that relationship is more critical to one's development as a, a moral human being than it is with their relationship with their biological parents, who are the rulers. It's a sign of of affluence and of class to yeah. have someone do the dirty work of parenting, which is really the attaching and the feeding and the playing and the attending to a child. Ch children need that from a caregiver and whether it's from a nanny or a parent. Having said that for, yeah, Robert and Cersei, their relationship was strained for a long time. And also Robert was a violent drunk uh, I know that Robert is supposed to be in some ways a, a hero to us in certain ways, but he regularly beat uh, everyone around him in his family, mm -hmm. uh, Joffrey and Cersei included. And we can all understand that that's not okay and it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt someone. And then Cersei herself, though, had her own developmental issues neurologically growing up in, a, in the Lannister household. Um, I did a whole deep dive on her personality too on my podcast, uh, you know, Psychology of Cersei, and uh, made some interesting discoveries when you really dive. Because, you know, Martin writes in such a dense way that little details are just like pass you right by, you know. Right. Oh, yeah. There's actually a fair amount of detail about Cersei's childhood and the way Jamie and Cersei were raised by their mom and their dad. Anyway, point is, is that Cersei herself uh, also had issues and was distant from Joffrey emotionally, but would shower him by spoiling him because he's the heir to the throne, right? Right. And so you have this weird combination. Imagine this, you're a kid and you're being treated like you're a God. And in some ways you kind of are a God in this society. You're the heir to the throne. Everything is, you know, all the hopes and dreams. Everyone's kissing your butt all the time. You have a father who is a drunk and who's beating you and, and clearly doesn't like you. You have a mother who is showering you with like accolades and, and narcissistic supply, but no love and, and no warmth, right? And you have a sis, and then you're looking around and, and everyone treats, says you're awesome, but you're not being treated emotionally like you're awesome. Mm -hmm. 
And that creates a tremendous amount of self-esteem issue in there. Now, you bring up the idea of nature versus nurture, you know, is it that he was born a psychopath, born antisocial? It's possible, obviously his official character, but um, uh, yeah, it's possible, but he clearly had the developmental uh, environmental circumstances that would often, that often can lead to these kinds of behaviors in children. Right. So, yeah, so, so actually this is your question, Miguel, so, so I'll just jump in and take it, even though yeah. it's yours. Go um, right ahead. If, if I think you've, you've sort of answered this, but Michele specifically asked, was it, was it Robert's neglect or Cersei's overcompensating that does more harm? I mean, I presume, it felt like you were saying it was a combination of the two, but... Uh... We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, well, if I was to blame the most of the problem, I would say it would be on whoever was taking care of him face to face. Because you could have a distant father who occasionally came in and abused you and was occasionally drunk. And if you had a secure base with someone, then that would be the saving grace to right. the abuse. Um, sure. Or vice versa. Like if Robert was abusive, but also majority of the time warm and attentive to him, then that could have saved him as well. But uh, the overall vibe that I get from that Martin sort of lays out between the lines is that Joffrey was raised as if he was awesome, not only by Cersei, but everyone else, but no one was really paying attention to him and no one really cared about his feelings. Right. So, so McKelly, let me just jump in with one more here. I, yeah. We, we've kind of, our, I'm looking at our questions and it feels like we, we've got off into the weeds immediately with our questions and we aren't really asking the big question, which is what, is your opinion of Joffrey? What is, I mean, if you, if you were to make a diagnosis, what do you think it would be? Well, he'd be diagnosed with conduct disorder today, okay. which is a precursor to antisocial personality disorder or psycho, psych, psychopathic personality disorder. On the internet, people call these people sociopaths, which is not the technical term that we right. use clinically. Uh, we call them psychopaths or people suffering from antisocial personality disorder. Conduct disorder is the a teenage or childhood equivalent of that personality disorder. It's things like being cruel, not having empathy, uh, being callous against other people's feelings, exploiting other people. Um, and he clearly did that. Yeah, and Martin yeah, clearly yeah. was writing with that in mind. We see right. cruelty to animals. We see sadistic behavior with no remorse towards people. And you know, it's one thing to be a ruthless ruler in this world, right? It's another thing to just arbitrarily like torturing people for no reason. And everyone around you is saying, what, why are you doing that? Right, right. No, right. That, that's not the way a king acts. Why, why are you picking on that person so much? And, and that's what happens with psychopaths and people suffering from conduct disorder is in the movies, we like to think of them as like Hannibal Lecter, like they're they're so smart and they always that 99% of the time psychopaths are shooting themselves in the foot with this disorder. They're trying to get, you know, things, but because of their disorder, everyone ends up turning against them because they're so blatant with their behavior and they're, they're kind of clue, clueless about what's happening. There's a lot of that in Joffrey. He was, he was very clueless and stupid on a lot of his choices. You know, he really shot himself in the foot no out of his effort, his desire to, harm other people it, it you could say that the entire war was started You're, you've read past that point right yes uh that he the entire war like he could have he could have had a a regular you know sadistic king, kingship <laughs> right but, but he decides sadistically against all advice yeah. to behead to behead ned 
No yeah. one wanted him to do that. Yeah. And, right. and he did it because he's a sadist and he wants to uh, see someone get their head chopped off. It, it gives him pleasure to do that. So, so just focusing on the, on the, the, the now of this. So is the distinction between the conduct disorder and the psychopathy teenage versus adult, is it because there's a different treatment path, a different sort of outcome? Well, that's a very technical question, my friend. Uh, yes. And with teenagers, we're never quite sure if it's temporary or not. Right. Sure. Uh, because yeah. there are some kids who have phases, you know, very unfortunate phases that they go through that they actually do grow out of. It's only later when we say, oh, that was the sort of conduct disorder that was emerging psychopathy. Right. Well. Interesting. So uh, back to some of the events in the story, um, do you think that Joffrey's horrible treatment of Sansa could have its roots in how Robert treated Cersei, like an, an example of how you treat a betrothed in this case or, or wife or significant other? Yeah, actually, I, I hadn't thought about that. It's a, a good insight um, that he was modeled what a king operates like. He was modeled what a man operates like. But through his psychopathic lens, he interpreted it in the behavior that he does towards Sansa instead of doing it perhaps in the Robert uh, abusive husband sort of way, right. which is not necessarily personality disorder, but more of a misogynistic control over women behavior that some men will do. Uh, but yeah, that's interesting to think about. And I, you know, I really thinking about Joffrey, I thought about this line of thinking a lot, which was that we have to remember that he was 13 when he became king. <laughs> So yeah, think about ourselves when we're 13 and how stupid we were, okay, <laughs> <laughs> and, and how black and white we were, you know, and, and oh, how sure. it's like, you know, especially if you're given a task of ruling the known world and how you might, and you see a lot of kids do this. Well, they're, they'll really assert their, their manlyhood, you know, certain boys will do this in very overt, silly ways, but we say, well, they're 13 uh -huh. and you wonder like if he had been given a chance to grow up a little bit more if he would have balanced out a little bit and not been so desperate to to prove himself but that leads me to another quality that he has which is what we call narcissism and i'm not sure if he suffers from the personality disorder but he definitely has the the personality leaning and that comes from uh his clear uh, amount of spoiling and constantly being told that he's awesome and the you know and beautiful and smart, you know, and the thing that they don't really show in the, in the TV show, I don't know about your all opinion is that in my head, I had a, a vision of like a young Brad Pitt, not, not the actor that they chose. Uh, Joffrey's supposed to be beaut like Jamie beautiful. I mean, he's the, he's the <laughs> daughter. He's the, he's the son of Jamie and, Oh, do we know that yet? Yeah, we know that. Yes, right. we do. Um, we do. Yeah. Not, not everyone in the book knows yet, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and he was tall and handsome. And uh, anyway, so he's, so he's treated like he's the most beautiful creature on the planet. He's the most special thing. And he is being neglected emotionally. And when you're in a situation like that, one of the available coping mechanisms you have as a child is to convince yourself that you are perfect. Because if you convince yourself of that, you stave off the notions of 100% worthlessness that's underneath it all mm. sure yeah does birth order play a part i mean joffrey's the eldest of three does is is these are these kinds of problems related to birth order is it the eldest is it the youngest who suffers most commonly do you hate your older brother is that what this is about uh, i just wonder why my younger brother hates me <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, uh, uh, birth order has no, uh, uh, factor in psychopathy. Except in this case, of course, because of the fact that he became the heir. And yes. so some of right. the things you were just talking about were forced on him because of the birth order in this case. Right. Yeah. We have to wonder if for whatever reason he had an older brother and he had the same genetics and the same, he would have been raised maybe a lot different, yeah. a lot Right. less expectations, a lot less narcissistic supply, 
a lot less disappointment from the father. I mean, we see Tommen and we don't get a lot of background about that, but we wonder about if Robert and Cersei were a little bit more tender with Tommen because they didn't need him to be a, a tough king. Sure. Right. Yeah. That's interesting because I was thinking about the fact that all three kids grew up in the same environment, but that might not technically be true because right. Joff was being groomed to be heir. So he might've had a, a different upbringing than his two younger siblings who don't seem to have the same issues that he does. Right. Now, speaking of what you were talking about a, a few minutes ago about Joff's appearance during my uh, research of some of the, the things you had mentioned, um, could you talk real quick about his, what is considered his feminine features and, um, you know, his pouty lips, his long curly blonde hair and how that might have affected him and helped bring some of this on? Yeah, I thought about that too, about how in a masculine uh, centered world, particularly if you're going to be king and being bullied for looking like a girl that he would overcompensate through overaggression. And people do this all the time. When people are quote unquote emasculated, they can't, they have a coping style available to them, which is to become hyper-masculine and to constantly assert their masculinity through overt toxic masculinity of right. aggression sure. and violence and put downs and um, other kinds of things that we could go into. But that's an absolutely sound hypothesis as to what might contribute to his behavior. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, some of your other answers have, have sort of led me to this, but um, one of the questions that we were both interested in was at various points, he was in sort of the prehistory of the books, there was talk of him being fostered elsewhere by, uh, by his grandfather, Tywin, at Casterly Rock, or, I mean, not exactly a fostering situation, but Robert hoped that Ned would help to bring him to heal. Uh, neither of those things happened. Neither of those had an opportunity to happen. But his outcomes could have been different had those things happened. Yeah. You just have to wonder if... And, it, and it's just interesting because it's, it's still kind of happening today among wealthy people. This notion of like, something's wrong with my kid. Well, what if we send them away? <laughs> you know, sure. uh, maybe that will teach them a thing or two <laughs> because what it ignores is the deep need that all children have for a secure attachment from day one. Now, in an, often situations, that's with the biological parents, but let's say that's not possible for various reasons. It has, it has to be with someone. And if it's a nanny, that nanny better stay in that person's life for a long time, you know? And we play real fast and loose with that sometimes because people aren't educated enough on attachment theory. Right. Now, one thing that we all know, but that Joffrey doesn't know is that he's a product of incest. So could that have a, like a biological repercussion that led to his psychological makeup? 100%. When you involve the... Uh, chance for recessive genes and other kinds of unfortunate mutations that can happen from inbreeding, there can be effects on your brain and your personality. Um, but given that he didn't have other malformations, if I were to be working with him, I wouldn't put that high on the list. I would, there's enough in his history <laughs> to point to why his personality developed. Sure. I, I wouldn't have to turn to a, you know, a, a genetic cause. Okay. Now, one thing that you, uh, that, that I found really interesting in um, some of your ideas on Joffrey was the uh, family systems theory. Could you talk a, a quick bit about that? Explain that? Yeah, it's, well, I made this episode, I don't know, seven years ago, so it's hard for me to remember <laughs> what I said. Um, but systems theory is, is the theory of looking at systems um, and applying the systems theory to human systems is that you will have a, uh, well, one of the phenomenon, one of the phenomena is that 
you will have a circular causality where people will be mutually affecting each other and causing the problem. So if we look at um, uh, Robert and Cersei and, and Joffrey, we look at how Robert wants it, you know, didn't really want Cersei to begin with, right? Right. But right. might have been, but might have been open, might have been like, well, maybe, maybe things will work out. And for Cersei, she thought this was her knight in shining armor at first, but then realized, oh no, he's not my knight in shining. Mm -hmm. So they both coped with that distance. And you could call it almost like a product of arranged marriages as well, right. which can work in any way. But she dealt with it by pulling away and going back to Jamie. Not at, not at first, by the way, you know, at first she tried to make it work. That's right. And with uh, Robert, I, he did, he dealt with the distance and the lack of closeness or the lack of intimacy by pulling away as well. So they, they both mutually caused each other's uh, behavior. They, by him pulling away, it made her to realize even more that this wasn't, you know, her knight in shining armor. For her pulling away, he realized, oh, this isn't a replacement for Lyanna Stark, right? Yeah. And uh, that's mutual causality. And as a family couple therapist, when I come in, I try to point out, like, from your from your perspective, you're distancing because the other person is distancing. But if you're both doing that, then we have massive distance. And then Joffrey comes along and uh, the child becomes triangulated into the situation. There's a, there's a just, by the time Joffrey comes along, particularly by the time he's like eight or something, the parents are at complete odds with each other, yeah. but Joffrey is a part of their life. And so each of them is communicating to the other person through the child. And you'll see people do this in divorces, right? And Robert, you could say was so hurt uh, of Cersei's distance that he would, you know, uh, harm Joffrey as a way of trying to get back at Cersei and Cersei would use Joffrey as a pawn in her ability to somehow say that he's a special thing and then of course Jamie gets pulled into the system as well yeah. <laughs> and all that but right. so I don't know if that answers your question but that's what comes to mind yeah that's great so well, one thing I was going to ask was I mean presumably George Martin is not an expert on mental illness um did has he done a good job of it? I mean, I guess the thing, the nature of this is you're just making someone up and you're giving him some traits and those traits could be diagnosed. I, is Joffrey believable? Yes. Okay. So it, he's, I don't know what his background in psychology is, but he is a history nerd. Okay. And, and he's basing Joffrey, at least in part, on actual human beings who exhibited this behavior in history. Right. And when you base it on a real person, then yeah, it's, yeah. uh, it's going to be a lot more accurate. Yeah. And I guess, and I guess you yourself don't need to have the knowledge of the mental illness you're, you're writing about because basically you're just replicating someone who had that trait and therefore you're. I mean, I guess so, but a lot of his characters, which is what makes him such a great writer. Cause there's a lot of, you know, fantasy ish writers out there. What I always loved about his writing was how the characters I just felt so connected to as real as real people. Right. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but behind me I have a I have a Tyrion uh, figurine. Actually, it's not really in the camera. It's like, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, Tyrion's character is just so rich, especially yeah. in especially in the books. Um, I also have a Brienne of Tarth uh, figurine. <laughs> um, <laughs> From the Sapphire Isles, right? And uh, but um, so he must, and good writers will be also psychologists. People uh, who write good characters are keen ob observers of humans. I was going to let you go if you want, McKelly. I feel like I've been stealing your questions. No, um, I think uh, I think. But uh, I want that last one if I yeah, can. Have yeah, it. Uh, yeah. That, go ahead. That's this is one I've been really looking forward to. And actually, you've you've already touched on it a little bit. Um, Presumably, in your professional life, life, you do meet people not dissimilar to Joffrey, and I wondered what your reaction to them was. Is is it? I presume you're not like I would be, which would be, oh my God, you're a monster. You're like Joffrey. You're probably a little bit more professional than that, and you're sort of sympathetic to them. 
but I'm I, I'm asking, not telling. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, that's a good way of putting it. Is uh, professionalism is important, also an understanding of it takes time to change, and you can treat people like this, and you can help them. You can help them to you know they're they're essentially trying to get their needs met. They're trying to have a sense of power, a sense of self-esteem, a sense of fun. But because they lack empathy, they don't really understand how to navigate relationships in a way that actually helps them. A lot of psychopaths end up in prison because they're lonely and they don't understand what's happening around them. And they're also quite impulsive, which is another thing that Joffrey was as well. Oh, yes. And they're often suffering. And so they they want help and and there's various different ways to help them you can't cure the psychopathy though it, it's a matter of how can they manage it so it doesn't ruin their life which they're most interested in and if we can connect other people's lives to you know if you harm other people it's going to ruin your life so right. and, and that's the only way that that's the only way that they typically will be motivated you know okay and and so there's that but uh I'm, an, I'm a human being like anyone else. And these individuals, depending on the severity, can be terrifying. And yeah, I'm when, sure. you talk to the, yeah, when you talk to them, it's, it's uh, common to have what we call countertransferential feelings of, of, of deep un, you know, lack of safety and of horror, really. Sure. One, that uh, someone like this exists. And two, I'm sitting in a room with them. You know? uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it, it can the way that they talk, and sometimes you know maybe often they'll try to pull one over on you. You know they're they're schemers. They're they're always they feel like the only way they can get their needs met is if they manipulate other people, and it's not true. And that's part of the treatment of just like you know you can just like ask me for things. You don't have to trick me into doing things. And part of that has to do with their upbringing and the way that they were raised. And that's how they essentially learned psychopathy was like, the only way I can get my needs met is if I'm tricking someone else. I have to plan in advance. I can't just be vulnerable and ask for something. Anyway, yeah, it, it's, it can be uh, terrifying. Uh, so we had some technical difficulties at this point and we lost Dr. Honda. Um, so we'll just sign off here. But I would like to say that that was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fascinating. Fantastic. Yeah, I could have talked was... to him for another two hours. I mean, I think he probably would have wanted off by before the end, before then. But <laughs> just right. absolutely amazing. I mean, his job sounds really interesting. Yeah, and um, you know, me with with my minor in psychology, I basically felt like I was, you know, you know, uh, talking talking <laughs> to someone at the same level. Yeah. I was talking shop with him. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I was I was not thinking the same thing. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, but that uh, was great. That really was. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Honda. I, yeah. I wish um, we could have. You could be here to hear that. Yes. yes. But, uh, yes. Um, w- definitely check out his podcast, um, Psychology in Seattle. Um, yep. And thank you so much, Dr. Honda. We we really appreciate it. And I, as I, I was just joking with McKelly before we started recording this, uh, as soon as someone does anything aberrant in Game of Thrones, we're going to have you back on to discuss it. You know, or in our family lives. <laughs> I don't remember that happening in Game of Thrones. <laughs> I don't remember the character Ethan. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, as always, thanks for listening. Yep. Thanks. Bye. Bye.